Excellent. Good morning, Anthony. How are you doing today? Hey, Arrow, good morning. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you perfectly, sir, because, man, I'll tell you what, your words on a page compared to your words in person are just, oh, my God, there, there's something about your path that is inspiring to all. Well, it's very, very sweet of you. It was a, it, was, it, it has been at times a rough path, but uh, it's been also an enjoyable path, even with the rough spots in it. Yeah, but isn't that what shapes us, those rough moments? And, and isn't that what this book is about, is to, to reach beyond where you think you are? No, no, no question. I think I think uh, for me, I've had an undeserved life. I, I grew up in a neighborhood uh, uh, with mostly people that didn't go to college, uh, m- mostly people that were working with their hands, my dad included. And so to be able to do the things that I've done in my life, I'm incredibly grateful. Uh, but I think the point I'm trying to make in the book to aspire to those things uh, without a lot of training, a lot of mentoring, you could smash yourself into the wall a few times. And when that happens, how do you handle yourself? And I think the message is you get up and don't be a stinker. You know, don't complain. (laughs) Just, you know, get up and and keep moving. You know what I mean? Brush that dirt off your knees, man. Get going. Get this game going. (laughs) Amen. And don't have any regret either. I think that's another big issue for people. They they make a mistake. They get up in the morning and say, wow, you know, I should have taken that road to the left as opposed to the road to the right. And they start to think about how their life could be had they gone left as opposed to right. But the truth of the matter is relax. It's just life. Everybody is making these mistakes. Everybody's, you know, taking the wrong turn in life at times. And uh, and and the, the big thing to help you with your happiness and help you with your self-satisfaction is just take the millstone of regret off your neck and go forward. Don't I don't wake up in the morning and say, wow, I really said some disastrous things in the White House, got myself fired. Uh, and again, I don't blame anybody but me for being fired. As you can tell from the book, I'm very accountable mm-hmm, mm-hmm. to my own firing. Uh, but I don't wake up and say, oh, let me kick myself in the pants this morning. I got fired from the White House seven years ago. We don't do that. We go forward. Yeah, yeah. I don't call it fired. I call it a stripe on your shoulder. Because obviously, chances are taken, and not everybody has to agree with what we're doing. But I look at that as being, okay, now here, welcome to the first step of my brand new beginning. Well, it's well said, and I and I and I think that is the resonating message that you, know, not to bore you with philosophy, but there's a ancient Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu, uh, put it better than me. If you think too much about your past, you're going to get depressed because mm. you have regrets, you've made mistakes. If you think too much about your future, you're going to get anxious because you can't really anticipate the future, and you'll start to worry about what's coming. And so your your, your best path, your best path for happiness, is to live in the present mm-hmm. and be present in every situation and disregard the past and frankly also the future because there's really not a lot you can do you can wake up in the morning work hard you can love your family and do those things and pray that good things happen but there's not a lot of control and i think that's the big message uh, from my book and from a lot of the books that i've read on this subject yeah i'm so glad that you put it that way because i've spent a lot of time researching grumpy old man syndrome i don't want to become that guy (laughs) and one of the things that they point to is that it it happens because men live in their past that's how important this book is is get out of your past and get in your moment yeah but you know listen and here's the thing you know warren i i I, I, just tell you this quick story i wrote to warren buffett and he wrote back to me. It was a beautiful letter he wrote back. And so I wrote to him again with an idea. I said, Mr. Buffett, you should have a uh, an investment library similar to like a presidential library. And you should yes. put it in Omaha, Nebraska. And it could be a learning center. He wrote back a rebuke of me. And he said that that's a monument to my death. He says, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in living. Wow. At the time that he wrote me that letter, he was 80 years old. And he said, by the way, my best life is ahead of me and i'm planning great things for myself my company and my family and you have to live ever present and ever hopeful about life and it was a rebuke of what i was asking him to do or suggesting but it was so enlightened in terms of uh, how this 81 year old man was tap dancing to work every day not being the grumpy person that you're describing arrow but being this ever hopeful, ever optimistic, excited person for life. Uh, and here he is today. I guess he's going to turn 94 here wow. in August. And think about these these last 12 or 13 years that he's had. They've been, they've been spectacular. And his point is, is that he didn't let the age define him and crick his neck and slump his shoulders and uh, retreat. 
he pressed forward even into his 80s and now into his uh, early 90s. What did you learn personally from writing this book? Because you had to revisit your chapters. Mm -hmm. Great question. I, uh, you know, uh, there was a over smugness to me. Mm. I'm really going to be self-observational and it doesn't reflect well on me. I think there was a lack of psychological mindedness and an over smugness. If I'm being brutally honest, I've been blessed. I got, you know, I was the captain of my high school football team, the president of my high school. I had a lot of things break my way and I was taking a lot for granted. And I would say other people's uh, hiccups, I probably wasn't feeling the pain of their hiccups or having enough empathy for the people mm -hmm. and that's a that reflects poorly on me honestly and and uh when i when i wrote this book and i finished the manuscript i sent it back to my editor she asked me the question you just asked me and i said i hope to god that these experiences that i've had these very humbling experiences have made me more empathetic and have made me more psychologically minded uh as i go forward from here you put that in such a beautiful way because in your chapters, in between jobs, sometimes they are the most meaningful. And, and and you putting people first like that really opens up a lot of people's eyes because, I mean, I work at a grocery store just because I just want to be with people. To be in the community where the, you cannot have judgment, all you can do is learn. I love people, and I think that might be my, my connection to this book. Well, you know, I, I tell a story in the book about a... Um, I mean, this is, again, doesn't reflect that well. I mean, I leave Goldman Sachs. I'm trying to build my business. Yep. I'm generally I'm generally insecure. So I joined the Harvard Club. This is a way for me, Arrow, to tell people I've gone to Harvard without having to actually <laughs> say it. I invite them to breakfast at the Harvard Club, right? And so I'm, I'm serving them meals, and there's a busboy there who's a terrific person. He's helping me, and, of course, I'm giving him a gratuity, try to treat people with kindness, uh, a couple of years into me doing this, the bus boy comes over to me and says, Mr. Anthony, I said, yes. He says, uh, you manage money. I said, yes, I do. He said, well, you're such a nice guy. He says, uh, my family just came into a $35 million wow. personal injury settlement. Would you be able to manage the money for me? Now, I, I wasn't actually, it wasn't my skill set. So I, I referred it to somebody else. But it's when you think about that, I'm there whining and dining and courting people, Arrow, uh, but the person that has the most money in the room turns out to be the busboy. Hmm. And it's a lesson about treating people with respect and treating people with kindness, not not being transactional, not expecting a quid pro quo or uh, being in a you know, being in a nonlinear relationship with somebody, just being kind for the sake of kindness. Um, and I write about that in the book. I think it's very important for people to get that. If they get that, they'll be a lot happier in life. The book we're talking about is From Wall Street to the White House and Back. You put some focus on Sam Bankman in this. I'm not embarrassed to admit that. Uh, I liked his family. Um, I was saddened by when I heard that uh, what he was perpetrating at FTX, I was saddened by it. And you just have to listen. You know, I, I like Sam enough where I was willing. I've worked on this business called Skybridge for the last 20 years. I have a 36-year career on Wall Street. I liked Sam and trusted Sam enough to sell him a piece of my business. Um, you know, he wanted to buy the whole business. I, I'm a little bit more of a gradualist. Thankfully, I only sold him 30% of the business. But but I'll just say this to you. That was great disappointment. It hurt me. It hurt my career. Mm -hmm. It hurt my reputation. I got uh, blasted because I'm a high-profile person. Um, you know, obviously, my Bitcoin position, I lost money in it, at least temporarily. It's back now. But... But, uh, you know, people wrote very nasty things about me. I'm a high profile person. Bad things are happening. You know, from the media, if it bleeds, it leads. Mm -hmm. And so bad stories sell, good stories don't. I was getting destroyed in the media. But another big lesson, go forward. I faced the media. I did interviews on CNBC, interviews on Bloomberg. I went to conferences to talk about it. I didn't want to be that guy where a bad thing is happening and I'm cutting and running. Uh, and I think sometimes in life when you face the music and you explain what your mistakes are, or you explain what you did right or wrong, I think people have more respect for you. And I think you frankly have more respect for yourself. You know, you don't have to hide when bad things are happening. You have to face the music. Wow. My 
my pastor, Stephen Furtick from Elevation Church would say, you run into the fire and then you teach those through your experiences. I think I think that's well said. You know, listen, I, I was uh, Stephen Colbert from the Colbert show was lighting me up on uh, the Colbert show. I think he called me a Jersey Shore cast member when I was in the White House. I mm. think he said I was Tony Soprano on the Potomac. I mean, this guy was <laughs> lighting me up. He had uh, he had cartoon renditions of me. And uh, when I got fired, they called and invited me on the show. The, uh, the PR person that I work with said, no way, you can't go on that show. They're going to devastate you on that show. And I said, no, I'm going on the show. Wow. I disagreed. I went on the show. Uh, it was about seven or eight days after my firing. They teased me. I teased him. Um, I think I brought him a front stabbing knife from my restaurant, the Hunting Fish Club. <laughs> um, and of course, the show made me put it in glass. They were afraid I was going to stab him with it. I laughed. <laughs> But 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 the uh, yeah we had fun together. He said to me, "Hey, do you think you're going to last a long time in the White House?" I'm like, "Well, I thought I was going to last longer than a carton of milk in the refrigerator. <laughs> yeah. I get blown out before the milk went bad." But but my point is, own it, own the problem, own the mistake. Don't run from it. You don't need to run from it. You know, share it, own it, be a part of it. And uh, you'll be so much more well served if you do that. Listeners need to know that your book is really filled with incredible stories, but it also features 25 lessons that really come directly from your heart and ambition in life. Well, yeah, I tried. I tried. And again, I tried to write it not in a, in a chapter style. Right. Because I don't have short attention spans now. And so these are three to five page lessons. You could pick up the book in the middle of the book and start reading or start at the end. Um, there's a there's a lesson there, and, and so you know it's it's a book that I sort of felt like this was uh, a little manual. And, and honestly, and I have five children. Uh, I think it's very important for parents to provide space for success and failure for their children. The children don't need to be perfect. None of us are. And so, writing a book like this, I was trying to explain to my kids, hey, go for it in life, and uh, if it works out, great. If it doesn't work out. Here's some things you can think about to uh, reset the stage for yourself and go forward. Being that New Jersey guy, how, how do you escape the the shadow of, of New York? Because so many people, brilliant people, come from New Jersey, but then they make their way to New York and say, yeah, I'm New York, New York. And it's like, no, be, be proud of New Jersey. Yeah. So, you know, that that is actually often a mistake with me. I'm actually from Long Island. Everyone thinks Whoa. I'm from Jersey. I guess. I guess it must be my accent or something like that, but uh, <laughs> but I I relate to the Jersey people. You know, I'm I'm a uh, you know Stevie Van Zant is a buddy of mine. Um, I relate to the Jersey people. Obviously, Governor Christie and I are very close. Uh, uh, Governor Phil Murphy was my boss at Goldman Sachs, and so I know Phil and Tammy Murphy for 35 years. So I get the ethos of New Jersey. I love New Jersey. Um, and uh, but I'm a Long Islander, so uh, you know when I sing the national anthem, I'm thinking of Billy Joel. The Jersey guys think of Bruce Springsteen or John Bon Jovi, but but I love those guys too. You know, I'm a, I'm a I'm a New York metropolitan sort of a guy. Wow. I, I can't go into this conversation without bringing up Tony Robbins. I mean, my God, yep. this guy has inspired the planet, and you got to be with him. I love Tony. You know, listen, I, I will say this about Tony, um, and I think I write about it in the book. Yes. You know, uh, he came to me when he was writing his investment books. He asked me to endorse it. I did. I asked him to endorse one of my other books, Hopping Over the Rabbit Hole. When I got in trouble in the White House and my wife and I were fighting, Tony called me and he said to me, hey, you know, you and Deirdre love each other. You have to fix this and come down and see me. I think we spent the weekend with him and Paige. We went to uh, one of his uh, shows, Date with Destiny or something like that. And uh, he's an inspiring guy. And Tony would say something that everybody can learn from. It's your mindset. Mm -hmm. Bad thing happens. How do you frame your mindset about the bad thing? And by the way, since you're human, unfortunately, some bad things are going to happen to you. You know, the human condition requires birth. It also requires death a result of which we're going to say goodbye to people that we love, whether it's a parent or a loved one. And I think Tony's probably the best at that in terms of sizing up. Here's the human condition. Here are the rules. How do you handle yourself? How do you comport yourself given these rules and these circumstances? 
And how do you allow yourself to be human? You know, Tony, Tony said something once to me, I'll share with you, the best among us, the best among us choose not to judge human frailty so harshly. Mm. So when you think about that for a second, so that's, that's not only human frailty in others, but how about ourselves? Mm-hmm. Let's go a little easier on ourselves, uh, continue our love affair with ourselves that we had when we were five or six years old. And, and don't overly judge ourselves when bad things are happening and vice versa with other human beings. Wow. Where can people go to find out more about you and everything that you've written? Because they need to, uh, to, to share you, you know, their, their love with you. Well, I'm at, I'm at Scaramucci on Twitter and Instagram and LinkedIn. I have two podcasts. I'm a big book reader. Nice. And so I have a podcast called Open Book where I interview authors, best-selling authors. That's been a great joy for me that's doing quite well. And I have a special podcast called The Rest in Politics U.S., uh, with a British journalist by the name of Caddy Kay, uh, which is a election special. So from now until election day, uh, Caddy Kay and I are analyzing both the British and the U.S. elections, oh. and what it means for this special relationship, and and uh, you know some inside baseball and what's going on in the campaigns. Oh my God! See, that's that's something to tap into. Please come back to the show anytime in the future, Anthony. The door is always going to be open for you. I appreciate it, Al. Great to talk to you, and. Uh, uh, Wishing you a great and amazing summer. You bet, man. Be brilliant today, okay? Thank you, man. You too.